Section 36 of The Underground Railroad, Part 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Underground Railroad, Part 4, by William Still. Section 36 helpers and sympathizers at home and abroad interesting letters the necessities of the committee for the relief of the destitute and way-worn travelers bound freedomward were met mainly by friends of the cause in philadelphia generous-hearted abolitionists nobly gave their gold in this work they gave not only material but likewise whole-souled aid in sympathy in times of need to a degree well worthy of commemoration while the name of slave is remembered the shipleys hoppers parishes motts whites copes wisters pennox sellers davis prices hollowells sharpless williams coates morris browns townsends taylors jones grues wises Lindsay's, Barker's, Earl's, Pew's, Rogers, Wharton's, Barnes, Wilson's, Wright's, Pierce's, Justice's, Smith's, Cavender's, Stackhouse's, Neal's, Dawson's, Evans, Lee's, Child's, Clothier's, Harvey's, Lang's, Middleton's, etc., are among the names well known in the days which tried men's souls, as being most true to the bondmen, whether on the Underground Railroad, before a fugitive slave law court, or on a rice or cotton plantation in the South. Nor would we pass over the indefatigable labors of the ladies' anti-slavery societies and sewing circles of Philadelphia, whose surpassing fidelity to the slave in the face of prejudice, calumny, and reproach year in and year out should be held in lasting remembrance in the hours of darkness they cheered the cause while we thus honor the home guards and coadjutors in our immediate neighborhood we cannot forget other earnest and faithful friends of the slave in distant parts of the country and the world who volunteered timely aid and sympathy to the vigilance committee of philadelphia not to mention any of this class would be to fail to bestow honor where honor is due we have only to allow the friends to whom we allude to speak for themselves through their correspondence when their hearts were stirred in the interest of the escaping slave and they were practically doing unto others as they would have others do unto them here truly is pure philanthropy that vital christianity that true and undefiled religion before god and the father which is to visit the fatherless and widow in their affliction and to undo the heavy burden and let the oppressed go free the posterity of the oppressed at least will need such evidences of tender regard and love as here evinced in those days such expressions of christian benevolence were cheering in the extreme from his able contribution to anti-slavery papers and his fearless and eloquent advocacy of the cause of the downtrodden slave in the pulpit on the platform and in the social circle the name of rev n r johnston reformed presbyterian of the old covenanter faith will be familiar to many but we think it safe to say that his fidelity and devotion to the slave are nowhere more fully portrayed than in the appended underground railroad letters Topsham, Vermont, September 1st, 1855. William Still, my dear friend, I have the heart, but not the time, to write you a long letter. It is Saturday evening, and I am preparing to preach tomorrow afternoon from Hebrews 13.3. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. This will be my second sermon from this text sabbath before last i preached from it arguing and illustrating the proposition deduced from it that the great work to which we are now called 
is the abolition of slavery or the emancipation of the slave showing our duty as philanthropists tomorrow i intend to point out our duty as citizens some to whom i minister i know will call it a political speech but i have long since determined to speak for the dumb what is in my heart and in my bible let men hear or forbear i am accountable to the god of the oppressed not to man if i have his favor why need i regard man's disfavor many besides the members of my own church come out regularly to hear me some of them are pro-slavery politicians the consequence is i preach much on the subject of slavery and while i have a tongue to speak and lips to pray they shall never be sealed or silent so long as millions of dumb have so few to speak for them but poor passmore williamson is in bonds let us also remember him as bound with him he has many sympathizers i am glad you did not share the same fate for some reasons i am sorry you have fallen into the hands of thieves for some others i am glad it will make you more devoted to your good work persecution always brightens the christian and gives more zeal to the true philanthropist i hope you will come off victorious i pray for you and your co-laborers and co-sufferers my good brother i am greatly indebted to you for your continued kindness the lord reward you i have a scholarship in an ohio college geneva hall which will entitle me any one i may send to six years tuition it is an anti-slavery institution and wholly under anti-slavery control and influence they want colored students to prepare them for the great field of labor open to men of talent and piety of that class when i last saw you i proposed talking to you about this matter but was disappointed very much in not getting to take tea with you as i partly promised have you a son ready for college or for the grammar school do you know any promising young man who would accept my scholarship or would your brother's son peter or levin like to have the benefit of it if so you are at liberty to promise it to any one whom you think i would be willing to educate write me at your earliest convenience about this matter i presume the standard will contain full accounts of the norristown meeting the williamson case and your own and those connected if it does not i will thank you to write me fully what causes the delay of that book the history of peter still's family etc i long to see it the lord bless you in your labors for the slave yours etc n r johnston topsham vermont december twenty sixth eighteen fifty five william still my dear friend i wrote to you some two or three weeks ago enclosing the letter to the care of a friend in philadelphia whom i wished to introduce to you i have had no answer to that letter and i am afraid you have not received it or that you have written me and i have not received yours in that letter i wish to receive information respecting the best way to expend money for the aid of fugitives lest you may not have received it i write you again though briefly a few of the anti-slavery friends mostly ladies in our village have formed an anti-slavery society and sewing circle the proceeds of which are to go to aid needy or destitute fugitive slaves they have appointed me corresponding secretary in obedience to my instructions and that i may fulfill my promises i want to find out from you the desired information we want to give the little money raised in such a way that fugitives who are really needy will be benefited by it write me as soon as possible where and to whom we should send the funds when raised i have thought that you of the vigilance committee in philadelphia had need of it or if not you can tell us where money is needed probably you know of someone in canada who acts for the needy there so many impositions have been palmed off upon charitable abolitionists i am afraid to act in such a case without the directions of one who knows all about these things is money needed to help those escaping if so should we send to new york philadelphia or where else when i was in new york last a young man from richmond virginia assuming the name of robert johnston who had come by steamboat to philadelphia and whom you had directed to the anti-slavery office in new york 
had only one dollar in money his fare had to be paid by a friend there the treasurer of the fund being absent i know that they nearly all need money or clothing we want to send our money wherever it is most needed to help the destitute or those in danger and where it will be faithfully applied write me fully giving specific directions and i will read your letter to the society and as i have been waiting anxiously for some two weeks or more for an answer to my previous letter but am disappointed unless you have written very recently i will be much obliged if you will write on the reception of this any information you may communicate respecting the doing of your section of the underground railway will be read before the society with much interest if you know the address of any one in canada who would be a good correspondent respecting this matter please give me his name my dear brother go on in your good work and the god of the oppressed sustain and reward you it is my earnest prayer yours fraternally in our common cause n r johnston topsham vermont december eighteenth eighteen fifty six william still very dear friend i will be much pleased to hear from you in our common cause in pennsylvania i am so far removed away here in yankeedom that i hear nothing from that quarter but by the public prints and as for the underground railway of course i hear nothing except now and then i would be greatly pleased if you would write me the state of its funds and progress whatever you write will be interesting the topsham sewing circle has begun its feeble operations again owing to much opposition a very few attend consequently little is made the ladies however have some articles on hand unsold which will bring some money ere long i wish you would write me another long letter in detail of interesting fugitives etc such as you wrote last winter and i will have it read before the circle your letter last winter was heard by the ladies with great interest you are probably not aware that fugitives are never seen here indeed the one half of the people have never seen more than a half dozen of colored people there are none in all this region i am lending peter still the book to my neighbors it is devoured with great interest it does good i think however if i had been writing such a book i would have wedged in much more testimony against slavery and its horrid accompaniments and consequences i would be glad to hear how peter and his family are prospering do you see my friends mr orr and rev wilson nowadays do they help in the good cause if the ladies here should make up fine shirts for men or children's clothes of various kinds would they be of use at philadelphia or new york to fugitives or would it not be advisable to send them there the ladies here complain that they cannot sell what they make my dear brother be not discouraged in your work your labor of love the prospect before the poor slave is indeed dark dark but the power shall not always be on the side of the oppressor god reigns a day of vengeance will come and that soon mrs stowe makes dread utter many a truth would that god would write it indelibly on the heart of the nation but the people will not hear and the cup of iniquity will soon fill to overflowing and whose ears will not be made to tingle when the god of sabaoth awakes to plead the cause of the dumb yours very sincerely n r johnston p s when i was in new york last fall october i was in the anti-slavery office one day when a friend in the office showed me a dispatch just received from philadelphia signed w s which gave notice of six parcels coming by the train etc and before i left the office the parcels came in each on two legs strange parcels that would run away on legs my heart leaped for joy at seeing these rescued ones oh that god would arise and break the yoke of oppression let us labor on and ever until our work is done until all are free since the late republican farce has closed i hope to get some more subscribers for the standard honest men's eyes will be opened after a while and the standard of right and expediency be elevated let us hope on and ever yours for the right n r j end of section thirty six recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section thirty seven of the underground railroad part four 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Underground Railroad, Part 4, by William Still. Section 37. Helpers and Sympathizers at Home and Abroad. Interesting Letters, Part 2. Topsham, Vermont, April 3, 1858. Dear Friend Still, I entreat you not to infer from my tardiness or neglect that I am forgetful of my dear friend in Philadelphia. For some time past I have done injustice to many of my friends, in not paying my debts in epistolary correspondence. Some of my dearest friends have caused to censure me, but you must pardon me. I have two letters of yours on hand, unanswered. One of them I read to the sewing circle, and part of the other. For them I most heartily thank you. You are far kinder to me than I deserve. May God reward you. I long to see you. My head and heart is full of the cause of the slave. I fear I give the subject too much relative importance. Is this possible? I preach, lecture, and write for the slave continually, and yet I don't do enough. Still I fear I neglect the great concerns of religion at home, in my own heart, in my congregation, and in the community. I wish we were located near to each other. We are far separated. I am almost isolated. You are surrounded by many friends of the cause. Still, we are laboring on the same wall, though far apart. Are we not near in spirit? You see by the papers that we have begun trying to do something in our Green Mountain State. The campaign has fairly begun. We will carry the battle to the gate. I see our friend Miss Watkins is still pleading for the dumb. Noble girl. I love her for her devotedness to a good cause. Oh, that her voice could be heard by the millions. I hope that we can have her again in Vermont. Give my kind regards to our mutual friend, Miller McKim. Will I not see him, and you, at the anniversary in New York? Do you ever see Reverend Wilson? Is he doing anything for the cause? I wish I could peep into your house tonight, and see if there are any packages on hand. God bless you in your labors of love. Yours truly for the slave. N. R. Johnston while it was not in the power of Mr. Johnston and his coadjutors to render any great amount of material aid to the committee, as they had not been largely blessed with this world's goods, nevertheless the sympathy shown was as highly valued as if they had given thousands of dollars. Not infrequently has the image of the singularly faithful minister entered the writer's mind as he once appeared when visiting the synod of his church in Philadelphia. Having the Underground Railroad cause at heart, he brought with him, all the way from Vermont, his trunk well filled with new shirts and underclothing for the passengers on that road. It was characteristic of the man, and has ever since been remembered with pleasure. From another quarter, hundreds of miles from Philadelphia, similar tokens of interest in the cause of the fleeing bondmen were manifested by a ladies' anti-slavery society. In western New York, which we must here record, as the proffered aid was wholly unsolicited, and as the committee had no previous knowledge whatever of the existence of the society, or any of its members, and withal, as the favors conferred, came at times when the cause was peculiarly in need, the committee oft times being destitute of clothing or money. The idea that the Underground Railroad was providentially favored in this respect was irresistible. We therefore take great pleasure in commemorating the good deeds of the society by copying the following letters from its president, Mrs. Dr. Brooks. Ellington, November 21st, 1859. Mr. William Still. Dear Sir, in the above-named place, some five years since there was formed a ladies' anti-slavery society, which has put forth its feeble endeavors to aid the cause of breaking every yoke and letting the oppressed go free. And we must trust, through our means, others have been made glad of heart. Every year we have sent a box of clothing, bedding, etc., to the aid of the fugitive, and wishing to send it where it would be of the most service, we have it suggested to us to send to you the box we have at present. You would confer a favor upon the members of our society by writing us, giving a detail of that which would be the most service to you, and whether or no it would be more advantageous to you 
than some nearer station, and we will send or endeavor to that which would benefit you most. William Wells Brown visited our place a short time since, recommending us to send to you, in preference to Syracuse, where we sent our last box. Please write, letting me know what is most needed, to aid you in your glorious work, a work which will surely meet its reward. Direct Ellington, Chautauqua County, New York. Your sister, in the cause, Mrs. M. Brooks. Ellington, Chautauqua County, New York, December seventh, 1859. Mr. Still, Dear Sir, Yours of the twenty-ninth was duly and gratefully received, although the greater portion of your epistle, of a necessity, portrayed the darker side of the picture, yet we have great reason to be thankful for the growing interest there is for the cause throughout the free states, for it certainly is on the increase, even in our own locality. There are those who, five years since, were, ashamed, must I say it, to bear the appellation of anti-slavery, who can now manfully bear the one, then still more repellent, of abolitionist. All this we wish to feel thankful for, and wish their number may never grow less. The excitement relative to the heroic John Brown, now in his grave, has affected the whole North, or at least every one who has a heart in his breast, particularly this portion of the state, which is so decidedly anti-slavery. At a meeting of our society today, in which your letter was read, it was thought best that I should reply to it, a request with which I cheerfully comply. We would like to hear from you, and learn the directions to be given to our box, which will be ready to send, as soon as we can hear from you. Please give us all necessary information, and oblige our society. You have the kind wishes and prayers of all the members, that you may be the instrument of doing much good to those in bonds, and may God speed the time when every yoke shall be broken, and let the oppressed go free. Yours truly, Mrs. Dr. Brooks. P.S. I have just learned that John Brown's body passed through Dunkirk, a few miles from this place yesterday. A funeral sermon is to be preached in this place one week from next Sabbath, for the good old man. Mrs. Dr. B. Ellington, January 2, 1860. William Still. Dear Sir, Enclosed are two dollars to pay freightage on the box of bedding, wearing apparel, etc., that has been sent to your address. It has been thought best to send you a schedule of the contents of said box, trusting it will be acceptable and be the means of assisting the poor fugitive on his perilous way. You have the prayers of our society, that you may be prospered in your work of mercy, and you surely will meet with a reward according to your merciful acts. Two bed quilts, thirty-two, eight dollars. Five bed quilts, twenty-four, fifteen dollars. One bed quilt, twenty-eight, three dollars and fifty cents. Two pairs cotton socks, three, seventy-five cents. Three pairs cotton stockings, four a dollar fifty one pair woolen stockings six seventy five cents one pair woolen stockings four fifty cents three pair woolen socks two seventy five cents five pair woolen socks three a dollar eighty eight cents eight chemise thirty two four dollars and fifty cents thirteen men's shirts sixty six cents eight dollars fifty eight cents one pair of pants twelve dollar and fifty cents six pair overall pants eighty cents four dollars and eighty cents three pair of pillowcases one dollar three calico aprons two seventy five cents three sun bonnets two seventy five cents two small aprons one twenty five cents one alpaca cape eight one dollar two capes one twenty five cents one black shawl four fifty cents total fifty six dollars fifty one cents the foregoing is a correct list of the articles and the appraisal of the same please acknowledge the receipt of the letter and box and oblige the anti-slavery society of ellington mrs dr brooks the road was doing a flourishing business during the short time that the station received aid and sympathy from the ladies anti-slavery society of ellington and little did we dream that its existence would so soon be rendered null and void by the utter overthrow of slavery. We have great pleasure in stating that beyond our borders also, across the ocean, there came help to a laudable degree in the hour of need. The numbers of those who aided in this special work, however, were very few and far between, a hundred percent less, so far as the receipts of the Philadelphia Committee were concerned, than was supposed by slaveholders and their sympathizers, 
judging from the oft-repeated allegations on this subject. It is true that the American Anti-Slavery Society and kindred associations received liberal contributions from a few warm-hearted and staunch abolitionists abroad to aid the great work of abolishing slavery. In reference to the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee, we are safe in saying that, except from a few sources, no direct aid came. How true this was of other stations, we do not pretend to know or speak, but in the directions above alluded to, we feel that the cause was placed under lasting obligations. The Webbs of Dublin and the Mrs. Wiggums of Scotland, representatives of the Edinburgh Ladies Emancipation Society, were constantly in correspondence with the leading abolitionists in different parts of the country, manifesting a deep interest in the general cause, and were likewise special stockholders of the Underground Railroad to Philadelphia. In common the stockholders at home, these transatlantic investors were willing to receive their shares of dividends in the answer of good conscience, or, in other words, from the satisfaction and pleasure derivable from a consciousness of having done what they could do to alleviate the sufferings of the oppressed struggling to be free. Having thus shown their faith by their works, it would be unjust not to make honorable mention of them. Last, though not least, at the risk of wounding the feelings of one who preferred not to let the left hand know what the right hand doeth, we may contemplate the philanthropic labors of one, whose generosity and benevolence knew no bounds, whose friendship, devotion, and liberality were felt in all the principal stations of the Underground Railroad, whose heart went out after the millions in fetters, the fleeing fugitive, the free, proscribed, ignorant, deprived of education, whose house was the home of the advocate of the slave from the United States, especially if he wore a colored skin or had been a slave. We would not venture to say how many of the enslaved this kind hand helped to purchase, Frederick Douglass and many others being of the number. How many were assisted in procuring an education? How many who pined in slave prisons were aided? How many fleeing over the perilous underground railroad were benefited? The all-seeing eye alone knoweth. Nevertheless, we are happy to be able to give our readers some idea of the unwearied labors of the friend to whom we allude. Here again, we are compelled to resort to private correspondence, which took place when Cotton was king, and the slave power of the South could boastingly say, in the language of the apocalyptic woman, I sit as a queen, and shall see no sorrow. When that power is maddened by desperation, by the heroism of the martyr, John Brown and the fettered bondmen were ever and anon traveling over the Underground Railroad. In this darkest hour, just before the break of day, the heart of the friend of whom we speak was greatly moved to consider the wants of the oppressed in various directions. How worthily and successfully her labors gave evidence of an earnest devotion to freedom, the mode and measures adopted by her, to awaken sympathy in the breast of the benevolent of her own countrymen, and how noble her example may be learned from a small pamphlet and explanatory letters which, when written, were intended especially for private use, but which we now feel constrained to copy from a sense of justice to disinterested philanthropy. End of section 37. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 38 of The Underground Railroad, Part 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Underground Railroad, Part 4, by William Still. Section 38. Pamphlet and Letters from Mrs. Anna H. Richardson of Newcastle, England, to the Friends of the Slave. Dear friends, for some months past my dear husband and I have wished very gratefully to thank you for having so kindly assisted us in various anti-slavery efforts, and we now think it quite time to give an account of our stewardship, and also to lay before you several items of interesting intelligence received from different parts of the United States. We will thank you to look upon this intelligence as private and must request you to guard against any portion of it being reprinted. William S. Bailey We have had great pleasure in forwarding 222 pounds 
to our valued correspondent william s bailey of newport kentucky one hundred and sixty pounds of this sum in response to a circular issued at newcastle in the summer of last year and received by our friend david oliver who acted as treasurer and the remainder chiefly collected by our dear young friends in england and ireland after reading the account of his little daughter laura this money has been very thankfully acknowledged with the exception of the last remittance just now on the road most of our readers will be aware that w s bailey's printing office and premises were again ruthlessly attacked after the harper's ferry outbreak on the unfounded assumption that he was mediating a similar proceeding and that it was unsafe for a free press to be any longer tolerated in kentucky his forms and type were accordingly dragged through the streets of newport and a considerable portion of them flung by a mob of gentlemen into the ohio river a few extracts from his own letters will pretty fully explain both his past and present position the subscription list on his behalf is still open and any further assistance for this heroic man and his noble-hearted family will be very gratefully received and forwarded newport kentucky november nineteenth eighteen fifty nine from my letter of the seventh instant you will have learned the sad intelligence that my printing office has been destroyed by a brutal mob of pro-slavery men through the money i received from you and other friends in this country i was moving the cause of freedom in all parts of kentucky the people seemed to grasp our platform with eagerness and the slaveholders became alarmed to see their wish to read and discuss its simple truths hence they plotted together to devise a stratagem by which they could destroy the free south and in the meantime the harper's ferry difficulty by mr brown was seized upon to excite the people against me and the most extravagant lies were told about me as trying to incite slaves to rebellion intending to seize the united states barracks at this place arm the negroes and commence war upon slaveholders all these lies were told as profound secrets to the people by the tools of the slave power but these lies have already exploded and the people are resuming their common sense again i tried your plan of non-resistance with all my power i pleaded with all the earnestness of my soul and so did my wife and daughters but though i am certain many were moved in conscience against the savage outrage and did their work with a stinging heart yet they felt that they must stick to their party and complete the destruction slavery indeed makes the most hardened savages the world ever knew the savage war-whoop of the indian never equalled the dastardly cry of shoot him cut his throat stab him and such like words most maliciously spoken slavery is the cause of this devilish spirit in men but this outrage has gained me many friends and will do much towards putting down slavery in the state it will also add many thousand votes to the republican presidential candidate in eighteen sixty god grant it may work out a great good i want to get started again as soon as i possibly can as soon as i can raise one thousand dollars i can make a beginning and soon after you will see the free south again and i trust a much handsomer sheet than it was before newport january sixth eighteen sixty yours of twelfth month seventeenth eighteen sixty is received containing a draft for fifty pounds and another of the little laura books which thank god is doing some good in newport and covington in the hands of two christian friends the renewed obligations under which the good people of england through your instrumentality place me and my abused people call for expressions of gratitude from both me and them beyond my ability to pen but you can imagine how we ought to feel in our trials and wants to such kind friends as you neither i nor my anti-slavery friends here can express our thankfulness in the elegant language your better educated countrymen may feel we should use but by the omnipotent judge of all hearts i trust our feeble effort will be accepted and you and yours be blessed and protected now and forever such encouragement strengthens me in the belief that the spirit of god is abroad in the hearts of the people 
moving them to sympathize with the poor, subjected slave. I have the promise of abler pens to aid me when I get started again, and I am glad to see that a poor working man and his family have been the means of calling the attention of men of letters to assist in raising from the dust a crushed race of men, and although the red clouds of war hover thick around us, and vengeance lurks in secret places, I trust, through the guidance of an all-wise director, to steer safely through the angry tide that now so often ebbs and flows around me. But should I fall, I trust, dear lady, that my dear wife and family may be remembered by the good and true. Newport, May twenty fifth, 1860 I am glad to tell you that we feel it a great victory over the slave power to be able to rise again from our ruins and in the face of slave-owning despots denounce their inhumanity and their sins i trust that almighty god will continue to be with me and my dear family in this good work you cannot but see i think by the southern press that slaveholders begin to fear and tremble for the safety of their peculiar institution the death of john brown is yet to be atoned for by the slaveholding oligarchy his undying spirit haunts them by day and by night and in the midst of their voluptuous enjoyments the very thought of john brown chills their souls and poisons their pleasures their tarring and feathering of good citizens their riding them upon rails and ducking them in dirty ponds their destruction of liberty presses and the hanging of john brown and his friends to intimidate men from the advocacy of freedom will all come tumbling upon their own heads as a just retribution for their outrageous brutality only let us persevere in oppressed humanity bent in timid silence throughout the south will rise and throw off the yoke of slavery and rejoice in beholding itself free newport august eighteenth i send you three copies of my paper since receiving your letter i and my family have done all in our power to get it out but we had to get old type from the foundry and sort it to make the sheet the size you now see it we hate to be put down by the influence of tyranny and you cannot imagine our sorrow anxiety necessity and determination i have received since the press was destroyed seven hundred dollars in all which has been spent in repairing and roofing our dwelling house and repairing the breaches made upon the office together with mending the presses and procuring job type and some little for the paper but nearly all the latter is old type our kindest thanks to the liberty-loving people of your country scotland and ireland and tell them i shall never surrender the cause of freedom a little money from all my friends would soon reinstate me and when they see my paper i trust it will cheer their hopes and cause a new fire for liberty in kentucky i cannot but sometimes ask in my closest meditations o god of mercy and love why permittest thou these things but still i hope for a change of mind in my enemies and shall press onward to accomplish the great task seemingly allotted to me upon kentucky soil the persecuted bereans there is another call connected with kentucky which we wish to bring before our friends at a village in that state called berea situated in madison county a little band of christian men and women had been pursuing their useful labors for some years past they had validly held anti-slavery sentiments but this was the beginning and end of their offending they possessed a farm and sawmill etc and had established a flourishing school these good people were quietly following their usual employments when in the early part of last winter sixty-two armed kentuckians rode upon horseback to their cottage doors and summarily informed them that they must leave the state in ten days time or would be expelled from it forcibly all pleading was hopeless and any attempt at self-defense out of the question they bowed before the storm and hastily gathering up their garments in three days time were on their road to ohio their three christian pastors took the same course one of the latter has since returned to kentucky to bury his youngest little boy and a graveyard attached to one of the churches there he was enabled to preach to the people who assembled on the occasion but was not allowed to remain in his native state another of the exiles ventured to go back to berea but this immediately led to an outbreak of popular feeling for his sawmill was set on fire by the mob 
and presently destroyed. The exiles are consequently still in Ohio, or wandering about in search of employment. We have been privileged in receiving two letters respecting them, from one of their excellent pastors, John G. Fee. This gentleman is himself the son of a slaveholder, but gave up his earthly patrimony many years since, for conscience sake, and has since made it the business of his life to proclaim the gospel in its purity, and to use every available means for directing all to Christ. On speaking of Berea, Mr. Fee remarks, The land was poor, but the situation beautiful, with good water and a favorable location in some respects. We could have had locations more fertile and more easy of access, but more exposed to the slave power. It was five miles from a turnpike road, with quite a population around it for a slave state. In one of Mr. Fee's letters, he introduces a subject which we wish especially to bring before our friends, feeling almost sure that many of them will respond to its importance. You ask, he says, if there are not noble-hearted young people in slaveholding families. There is one whom I desire to commend to your special prayer and regard, Elizabeth Rawlings, daughter of John H. Rawlings of Madison County, Kentucky. He was once a slaveholder, but has twice been a delegate to our Free Soil National Conventions, and is a strong friend of freedom. His daughter has had small opportunities for acquiring knowledge, who was in our school at Berea, and making rapid progress. Our school was not only anti-slavery, but avowedly anti-caste. This made it the more odious. When Mr. Rogers and others were about to be driven away, she announced that she would continue the school on the same principles. Accordingly, she went into the schoolroom after a few days with a little band of small scholars, and has perseveringly kept it up. This noble and brave-hearted young woman is about twenty-two years of age, has a very vigorous mind, acquires knowledge very rapidly, is very modest, and is, I trust, a true believer in Christ. I desire to see her fitted for the post of teacher. One year's study would greatly benefit her. She has not gone beyond grammar and arithmetic. I have not means, or would at once give her those advantages she needs. I once had a small patrimony, but expended it in freedom's cause, and now live on the small salary of a home missionary. I have a daughter of fifteen, as far advanced as Miss Rawlings. I want to train and educate them both for teaching, and had thought to educate the latter, and suggest to someone to educate the other. I do not urge, but simply suggest, this might be another cord binding the two continents. Lewis Tappan of New York would receive to transmit, and I would report. Now if we may lay before you, dear friends, our heart's inquiry, it is this. Cannot we in England raise fifty pounds or sixty pounds for one year's schooling for these two dear girls, Elizabeth Rawlings and J. G. Fee's daughter? It seems to us that the one deserves it from her noble daring, the other as a little tribute to her father's virtues. How delightful it would be if these two young people could become able teachers of our own rearing, and in days to come be looked to as maintaining schools of an elevated character upon their native soil. We have laid the case before a few kind friends, and already had the pleasure of forwarding eight pounds to Mr. Fee's care on behalf of his valued young friend, Elizabeth Rawlings. Cornelia Williams The next person to be referred to is Cornelia Williams, a bright young niece of our friend, Henry H. Garnett's, whom many of our friends kindly assisted to redeem from slavery in North Carolina about three years since. We rejoice to say this dear girl is going on very satisfactorily. She has been diligently pursuing her studies in a school at Nantucket, and appears to be much esteemed by all who know her. She kindly sends us a little letter now and then, again returning her glowing thanks to all who assisted in procuring her freedom. Her mother, Dinah Williams, also a slave a few years since, and redeemed in part by the surplus of the Weems Ransom Fund has married an estimable Baptist minister within the last year, and Cornelia resides under their roof. End of section 38 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 39 of The Underground Railroad, Part 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Underground Railroad, Part 4, by William Still. Section 39. Pamphlet and Letters, Part 2. Frederick Douglass. It is known that our much valued friend Frederick Douglass left this country suddenly for America last spring, chiefly on account of the decease of a most beloved little girl. Till quite recently he was intending to return to England very soon. But this is for the present delayed, on account of increasing and pressing engagements in the United States. We take the liberty of quoting an extract from one of his letters. Rochester, July 2nd, 1860 You hold up before me the glorious promises contained in the sacred scriptures. These are needed by none more than by those who have presumed to put themselves to the work of accomplishing the abolition of slavery in this country. There is scarcely one single interest, social, moral, religious, or physical, which is not in some way connected with this stupendous evil. On the side of the oppressor there is power, now as in the earlier days of the world. I find much comfort in the thought that I am but a passenger on board of this ship of life. I have not the management committed to me. I am to obey orders and leave the rest to the great captain, whose wisdom is able to direct. I have only to go on in his fear and in his spirit, uttering with pen and tongue the whole truth against slavery, leaving to him the honor and the glory of destroying this mighty work of the devil. I long for the end of my people's bondage, and would give all I possess to witness the great jubilee. But God can wait, and surely I may. If he, whose pure eyes cannot look upon sin with allowance, can permit the day of freedom to be deferred, I certainly can work and wait. The times are just now a little brighter, but I will walk by faith, not by sight. For all grounds of hope founded on external appearance have thus far signally failed and broken down under me. Twenty years ago, slavery did not really seem to be rapidly hastening to its fall. But ten years ago, the Fugitive Slave Bill, and the efforts to enforce it, changed the whole appearance of the struggle. Anti-slavery in an abolition sense has been ever since battling against heavy odds, both in church and state. Nevertheless, God reigns, and we need not despair, and I for one do not. I know, at any rate, no better work for me, during the brief period I am to stay on the earth, than is found in pleading the cause of the downtrodden and the dumb. Since I reached home, I have had satisfaction of passing nearly a score on to Canada, only two women among them all. The constant meeting with these whip-scarred brothers will not allow me to become forgetful of the four million still in bonds. Our friends may, perhaps, remember that the cost of Frederick Douglass's paper is but five shillings per annum, with the exception of a penny per month at the door for postage. It is a very interesting publication, and amply repays the trifling outlay. F.D. will be glad to increase the number of his British readers. He also continues gratefully to receive any aid from this country for the assistance of the fugitives who are so often taken refuge under his roof. Another letter of his remarks, when speaking of them, they usually tarry with us only during the night, and are forwarded to Canada by the morning train. We give them supper, lodging, and breakfast, pay their expenses, and give them half a dollar over. Fugitive Slaves we next turn to the communication of another warm friend to the fugitives in the state of blank. The following is an extract from a recent letter of his. We have had within the last week just nineteen underground passengers. Fifteen came last Saturday, between the hours of six in the morning and eleven at night. Three only were females, wives of men in the parties. The rest were all able-bodied young men that they were all likely looking it needed no southern eye to decide and that their hearts burned within them for freedom was apparent in every look of their countenances but it is only of one arrival that my time will allow me to speak on the present occasion this consisted of two married couples 
and two single young men. They had been a week on the way. To accomplish the desired object, they could see no way so feasible as to cross the blank bay. By inquiry, they gained instructions as to the direction they should steer to strike for the lighthouse on the opposite shore. Consequently, they invested six dollars in a little boat, and at once prepared themselves for this most fearful adventure. To the water and their little bark they stealthily repaired, and off they started. For some distance they rode not far from the shore. Being in sight of land, they were spied by the ever-watchful slaveholder, or someone not favorable to their escape. Hence a small boat, containing four white men, soon put out after the fugitives. On overhauling them, stern orders were given to surrender. The boat the runaways were in was claimed, if not the party themselves. With determined words, the fugitives declared that the boat was their own property, and that they would not give it up. They said they would die before they would do so. At this sign of resistance, one of the white men, with an oar, struck the head of one of the fugitives, which knocked him down. At the same moment, another white man seized the chain of their boat, and the struggle became fearful in the extreme for a few moments. However, the same spirit that prompted the efforts to be free moved one of the heroic black bondmen to apply the oar to the head of one of their pursuers, which straightway laid him prostrate. The whites, like old Apollyon in the Pilgrim's Progress, at this decided indication that their precious lives were, might not be spared if they did not avail themselves of an immediate retreat, suddenly parted from their antagonists. Not being contented, however, thus to give up the struggle, after getting some yards off, they fired a loaded gun in the midst of the fugitives, peppering two of them considerably about the head and face, and one about the arms. As the shot was light, they were not much damaged, however, at any rate not discouraged. Not forgetting which way to steer across the bay, in the direction of the lighthouse, they rode for that point with all possible speed. But their bark being light, and the wind and rough water by no means manageable, ere they reached the desired shore they were carried a considerable distance off their course, in the immediate vicinity of a small island. Leaving their boat they went upon the island, the women sick, and their repose without food, utterly ignorant of where they were for one whole day and night, without being able to conjecture when or where they should find free land, for which they had so long and fervently prayed. However, after thus resting, feeling compelled to start on again, they set off on foot. They had not walked a mile ere, providentially, they fell in with an oyster-man, and a little boy waiting for the tide. With him they ventured to converse, and soon felt that he might be trusted with, at least, a hint of their condition. Accordingly, they made him acquainted in part with their piteous story, and he agreed to bring them within fifteen miles of blank for twenty-five dollars, all the capital they had. Being as good as the word, he did not leave them fifteen miles off the city, but brought them directly to it. Happy! How happy they were at finding themselves in the hands of friends, and surrounded with flattering prospects of soon reaching Canada, you may imagine, but I could not describe. Footnote. In those days the writer, in giving information, enjoined the utmost secrecy, considering that the cause might be sadly damaged simply by being inadvertently exposed even by friends, thousands of miles away. The pro-slavery mob spirit at that time was also very rampant in Philadelphia and other northern cities, threatening abolitionists and all concerned in the work of aiding the slave. End footnote. Thanks to the benevolent bounty of several kind donors, we had lately the pleasure of sending a few pounds to the writer of the foregoing letter. We omit his name and residence. He belongs, like Douglas, to the proscribed race. Who would not help these generous-hearted men, who are devoting their whole energies to the well-being of the crushed and downtrodden? We are the more encouraged to send out this little sheet, made up of thanks and requisitions, because occasional inquiries are reaching us out of, What can we do for the slave? We are hearing but little about him, and do not know how to work on his behalf. Allow us to say to one and all, who may be thus circumstanced, that we do not look for great things, but that they can levy a shilling a year from all who feel for the injured bondman, these little sums will soon mount up, and prove of incalculable service to those who are struggling for freedom. As to the special destiny of these shillings or half-crowns, 
let the subscribers choose for themselves and their kind aid will be sure to be truly welcome to the party receiving it we do not ask for such contributions to be forwarded through newcastle unless this is a matter of convenience to those concerned if there be other modes of sending to the united states within the reach of the friends who receive this paper let them by all means be used we are always happy to receive aid for the fugitives or for any other anti-slavery cause and consider it no trouble at all to send it on but do not wish to be monopolizing as far as kentucky is concerned that state being constant and mob law rampant there we shall continue gratefully to receive assistance on its behalf and to avail ourselves of the accustomed mode of reaching it thus having been proved to be both safe and easy free labor produce and lastly as to the long prized principle to our minds the very alphabet of anti-slavery action the importance of encouraging the growth and consumption of free produce rather than that raised by the sweat and blood of the bondmen our convictions of the righteousness of this course are as strong as they ever were but perhaps we hoped too much relied too fondly on the conscientiousness of the british anti-slavery public and supposing that a sufficient number of individuals could be found prepared to make a slight sacrifice for humanity's sake and to keep the oppressed continually in mind by a little untiring painstaking we hardly supposed that the most strenuous efforts in this direction would be enough to affect the british market but we did believe and believe still that not only is there a consistency and a preference for free produce but that this preference is encouraging to the free laborer and that humanly speaking nothing is more calculated to nerve his hand and heart for vigorous effort the principle of abstinence from slave produce may be smiled at but we are quite sure it is an honest one and as a good old proverb observes it takes a great many bushels full of earth to bury a truth but while this self-denying protest has been going on in a few limited circles how great is the advance the free labor has been making within the last two years who is to say whether some of those quiet testimonies may not have contributed to erect that mighty machinery that is now adding to its wheels and springs from day to day and which bids fair at no distant period to supersede slave labor and its long train of sorrow and oppression earnest lectures have just been delivered in newcastle by our colored friend dr m r delaney lately engaged in a tour of observation in west africa where he longs to establish a nourishing colony of his people whose express object shall be to put down the abominable slave trade and to cultivate free cotton and other tropical produce we wish this brave man every encouragement in his noble enterprise he has secured the confidence of the african aid society in london one of whose earliest measures has been to assist him with funds the present secretary of the society is frederick w fitzgerald seven adam street strand london and who need speak of the zambezi and dr livingstone or of central or eastern africa or of india or of australia or of the prolific west india islands as we prepare this little sheet a kind letter has now come in from stephen bourne for many years a stipendiary magistrate in jamaica and now the ardent promoter of cotton growing company of that island he says to us when writing from london on the nineteenth instant our scheme embraces more than meets the eye and to illustrate this i send a map with prospectus of the proposed estate by which you will see that we reckon on obtaining cotton by free labor by mechanical agency from jamaica at a price so far below that which it can now be produced by slave labor that if we succeed we shall put an end to the whole system as no one will be able to afford to carry it on in competition with free labor jamaica is much nearer and easier of access for fugitives from cuba and puerto rico than canada is to georgia virginia or louisiana if therefore we can offer them an asylum and profitable employment on the estate we shall open up a new underground railroad or rather enable the slaves to escape from cuba by getting into a boat and in one night finding their way to freedom there is no doubt they could do this at much less risk than slaves now incur in order to obtain liberty in, in america the proposed estate in jamaica consists of about one thousand acres and the shares in this company are ten pounds each one pound only to be called immediately the rest by installments the liability is limited full information may be obtained by addressing stephen bourne esquire 
55 Charing Cross, London, for the secretary of the Jamaica Cotton Growing Company, C. W. Straitfield, Esquire. We rejoice to see that this new company is being supported not only by benevolent philanthropists and capitalists in London, but by experienced Manchester manufacturers, among the rest by the excellent Thomas Clegg, so well known for his persevering efforts in West Africa, and by Thomas Baisley, M.P. for Manchester, and most extensive cotton spinner. Their mills would alone consume the cotton grown on three such estates as that which it is proposed to cultivate. There is abundant room, therefore, for cultivation of cotton by the emancipated freeholders. Communications have also reached us from Demerara. Charles Rattray, a valuable Scotch missionary in that colony, was in England last spring, and went back to his adopted country with his mind full fraught with the importance of cotton growing within its borders. He happened to have small samples of Demerara cotton with him. These were shown to be cotton brokers and manufacturers in Liverpool and Manchester, and were pronounced to be most excellent, so much so that specimen gins and a supply of cotton seed were kindly presented to him at the latter place, before he left England. Mr. Wattray is now bringing the subject before his people, and is also intending to plant with cotton seed some ground belonging to the mission station. But we will not further enlarge, commending our cause to him, who has promised never to forget the poor and needy, and that in his own good time he will arise from their deliverance and break every yoke. I remain sincerely and respectfully your friend, Anna H. Richardson. 54 Westmoreland Terrace, Newcastle on Tyne, 9 month, 22, 1860. P.S. Since writing the above, we have seen it stated in the Principia, a New York paper, that William S. Bailey has been arrested on a charge of publishing an incendiary paper, and held to bail in the sum of one thousand dollars, to appear before the circuit court in November next. It is further stated that one of the two magistrates by whom W. S. Bailey was examined, and held to bail on this charge, was the chosen leader of the mob that destroyed his type and printing press. We have yet to see what will be the end of this cruel conflict. Let us not desert our suffering friend and his noble-hearted family. End of section 39. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 40 of the Underground Railroad, Part 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Underground Railroad, Part 4, by William Still, Section 40. Letters to the Writer, Westmoreland Terrace, December 28, 1860. My esteemed friend, I received thy touching letter of the tenth instance, a few days since, and hasten to assure thee of our heartfelt sympathy and most lively interest in the present tremendous state of things around you. At the same time, I cannot tell thee how glad and thankful we feel that with God's help thou art determined to persevere and not in any way flinch in this day of sore trial. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Be strong, fear not. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. One thing, too, is sure, that all things will work together for the good of those who may love their Lord, that he will never, never forsake them, whatever their outward trials may be. I think, dear friend, thou shouldst be careful not to be about alone, particularly in the evening. We heard from W. S. Bailey the other day, and he spoke of the advantage of several kind friends sticking close to him under recent circumstances at Alexandria, when he was exposed to the spite and rage of slaveholding bullies. Would it not be well to make a habit, in the evening in particular, of you who are marked men, going about in little companies? 
Wicked men are generally cowards, and I think would hesitate more to do a bad act in the presence of observers. I think thou wouldst receive a little letter from me a day or two after thine was written, through our friend Samuel Rhodes, enclosing seven pounds for the fugitives, five pounds for thy own use, and two pounds for the vigilance committee. This letter of mine was sent off about the twelfth ultimo, but I conclude was not delivered till just after thine was written. It is well to keep us fully informed of your circumstances, whether favorable or more appalling. I do not intend to put anything of a private character into print, but private confidence is the creed in England, and thou needst not fear my abusing it. I enclose the only paper that we have printed that thou mayst see there is nothing to fear. Thou wilt observe there is no reference either to thine own name or to Philadelphia, and people here are not very familiar with American topography. I am sending W. S. Bailey one of the same papers by today's mail. We have merely a limited number of them printed. I cannot very well obtain money from my friends, with numerous home claims constantly pressing on them, without having something to show. Some fugitives are now beginning to reach England. A gentleman in London wrote to me a day or two ago to know if we could find a berth for a fine fellow who had just applied to him. He had arrived by steamer from New York after residing there for three years. A policeman in the street, good-naturedly, whispered to him his own name, and then that of his master's. He was sure that peril was at hand, and that having been branded for escaping before, he should be whipped to death if taken again, so he packed up his little wardrobe and embarked for England immediately. Another poor fellow is in this town, recently from Charleston, whence he escaped among some cotton bales to Greenock. He is getting fair wages in the saw-yard, and likes England very well if it were not for the thought of his poor wife and children still in slavery. We invited him the other day to a working men's tea party, where I had been asked to make tea for them, and he gave us quite an able account of his travels. The men kindly invited him to join their benefit club, and told him they would like to have a colored brother amongst them. Art thou not thinking, dear friend, of asking your people to emigrate to the African coast, or the West India Islands? Two gentlemen in London are writing most warmly about this. I wrote to Mr. Fitzgerald's address on the enclosed paper. Instead of being colonizationists in the objectionable sense, he and Mrs. Bowen are burning with love to your people, and are fervently desirous of doing them all the good they can. I cannot see why little united parties should not promptly emigrate under the wing of these gentlemen. Assure those who think and feel with thee, dear friend, and are nobly determined to suffer rather than to sin, that according to our very small ability we will not desert them in their hour of trial and danger. We commend them to him who can do for them a thousand times more, and better than we can either ask or think, with our united kindest remembrance, sincerely, Anna H. Richardson, Westmoreland Terrace, Newcastle on Tyne, March 16, 1860. We have lately read the life of thy brother and sister, Peter and Vina Still, dear friend, with the deepest interest. It is a most touching and beautiful book, and we think should be either reprinted in England or sent over here very largely. My husband and I are hardly acquainted with a volume more calculated to stir up the British mind on the subject of slavery. Great Britain is just now getting really warm on the anti-slavery subject, and is longing to shake herself from being so dependent as hitherto on slave produce. Why, oh, why should not the expatriated blacks go to free countries and grow produce for themselves and for everybody who requires it? Why not, in time, become merchants and princes in those countries? I am told, as a secret, that this subject is likely, ere long, to be taken up in high quarters in England. We are feeling hopeful, dear friends, about thy crushed and persecuted people, for surely God is working for them by ways and means that we know not. I have been careful to keep it in private circles, but thy valuable letter of last July has been read by many with the deepest interest. A dear young lady from Dublin is by my side, and has but this minute returned it to me. It is but a little, 
but i have gathered four pounds by its perusal here and there i am not able to forward so small a sum in this letter but some way wish to send two pounds of this amount for thy own use and the other two pounds for your vigilance committee it so happens that we have not anything for the better from our own anti-slavery association this year very sincerely thy friend my dear husband uniting in kind regards anna h richardson woodhouse near newcastle may third eighteen sixty an occasional rural residence of ours five miles from home to william still i have again to thank thee dear friend for a kind letter and for the perusal of three letters from thy fugitive friends it must be truly cheering to receive such and their warm and affectionate gratitude must be as rich reward for many anxieties i conclude that it is not necessary for those letters to be returned but should it be so let me know and i will be on the lookout for some private opportunity of returning them to philadelphia such occur now and then we like to see such letters they assist us to realize the condition of these poor wanderers i am sorry for not having explained myself distinctly in my last the promised four pounds were for the fugitives being gathered from various christian friends who gave it me for their particular use but we wished half of that sum to be laid out as on a previous occasion at thy own discretion irrespective of the vigilance committee i have now another one pound to add to the latter half and would gladly have enclosed a five pound note in this envelope but we are rather afraid of sending the actual money in letters and our london bankers do not like to remit small sums i shall continue to watch for the first opportunity of forwarding the above our valued friend samuel rhodes has been lately in heavy sorrow i send this through his medium but fear to add more lest i should make his letter too heavy with our united kind regards very truly thy friend anna h richardson fifty four westmoreland terrace june eighth eighteen sixty dear friend william still it is a good plan to send me these interesting communications the letter to your coadjutor at elmira reached us a few days since that depot must not be allowed to go down if it be possible for this to be prevented perhaps j w jones might be encouraged by a gift from england that is by a little aid from this country expressly for the fugitives being put into his hands if you think so i am sure my friends would approve of this and you can use your own discretion in giving him our gifts in one sum or by detached remittances the greatest part of the money on hand has come in from the private perusal of thy interesting letters and my friends simply gave my husband and me their money for the fugitives leaving the exact disposal of it to our own discretion it has struck me of late that if i may be allowed to print occasional extracts from thy letters with the other anti-slavery information it would greatly facilitate the obtaining of pecuniary aid as it is i can lend a private letter to a trustworthy friend but if by any chance this letter got lost it would be awkward and it is also impossible of course to lend the original in two quarters at once then again the mechanical trouble of making copies of letters is not convenient much sedentary employment does not suit my health and i cannot manage it i have been thinking of late that if my friends in various parts of the country could be supplied with a small quarto an occasional printed letter for private circulation it would save a great deal of trouble and probably bring in considerable aid my husband and i have long been accustomed to preparing tracts and small periodicals for the press so that i think we know exactly what ought to be made public and what not if thou likest to give me this discretionary power do so and i will endeavor to exercise it wisely and in a way that i feel almost certain would be in accordance with thy wishes the sum now remitted through our friend samuel rhodes is eight pounds of this we should like three pounds to be placed at thy own discretion for the benefit of the fugitives three pounds if you approve it in a similar way to be handed to j w jones and two pounds as formerly to be handed to the philadelphia vigilance committee 
the latter is not however as in past times from the newcastle anti-slavery society for i am sorry to say it is not a sufficiently painstaking and executive little body but more apt to work by fits and starts but from our private friends who kindly place their money in our hands as their anti-slavery stewards my friend s r will therefore kindly hand for us three pounds for william still for fugitives three pounds for j w jones for fugitives two pounds for the philadelphia vigilance committee for fugitives total eight pounds we are very sorry for thee to have to incur so much persecution be of good cheer the right will eventually triumph if not in this world in that day when all shall be eventually righted on our lord's right hand oh for ability in the meantime to love him trust him confide in him implicitly many thanks for the anti-slavery standards no one in this town takes them in consequently we only see them occasionally do any tidings reach you of our friend frederick douglas we heard from him from portland but are anxiously looking for another letter he always spoke of thee my friend very kindly and one day when some money had been given to him for fugitives said you shall have part of this if you like for william still but i said no i will try and get some elsewhere for him douglas left us in april after losing his little annie but wished his visit to be kept private and hoped to be able to return to england in august my husband and i will agree with f d in political matters we are not disunionists but want to mend your corrupted government with kind regards sincerely thy friend a h r we are well acquainted with william and ellen craft they have just sent us their little book newcastle fifth month two eighteen sixty one w still dear friend that poor fellow who was so long secreted had been often in my thoughts when laying this case of the fugitives before our friends i should like thee to feel at liberty to replace the remainder of the twenty-five dollars from the accompanying ten pounds which i have much pleasure in forwarding but think it better to mention that it may perhaps be the last remittance for some little time from this quarter as i do not at present see any immediate opening for getting more our worthy friend w s bailey has lately been here and dr cheever and w h day are expected in a week or two from london too there are very earnest appeals to assist the african anti-slavery society thank thee for the newspapers and thy last kind note i think thou rather overrates my little services what crisis is coming oh what will the end be with our united best wishes thy sincere friend anna h richardson seven pounds of this money is from some personally unknown friend at lancaster five pounds from two nice little children of my acquaintance fifty four westmoreland terrace newcastle on tyne october tenth eighteen sixty two i have pleasure dear friend in sending you five pounds for your contrabands in response to your last letter of the seventeenth ultima it is not much but may be a little help it will be forwarded by our valued and mutual friend h h garnett to whom i am sending a remittance for his contrabands by the same mail we shall be interested in any particulars you may like to send us of these poor creatures but at the same time i dare not hold out any hopes of considerable assistance from england for our own manufacturing districts are in a starving state from the absence of the accustomed supply of cotton and till this has been grown in other quarters they will continue to have a strong claim on every thoughtful mind some of us would rather work with your colored people in your own cause than with any one else for we do not like the war and do not at all approve of the american churches committing themselves to it so fearfully if your president had but taken the step at first he is taking now what rivers of blood might have been stayed it is remarkable how you as a people have been preserved for each other without having your own hands stained with blood but as to expatriation the very thought of it is foolish you have been brought to america not emigrated to it and who on earth has any possible right to send you away 
some of us are almost as much displeased with the north for talking of this as with the south for holding you in slavery what can we say to you but watch and pray hope and wait and surely in his own good time the most high will make you a pathway out of trouble we are delighted to hear of the good behavior of your people wherever they have a fair chance of acting on the borders as upright men and christians very sincerely your friend to william still anna h richardson end of section forty Section 41 of the Underground Railroad, Part 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry. The Underground Railroad, Part 4, by William Still. Section 41. Woman Escaping in a Box, 1857. She was speechless. In the winter of 1857, a young woman, who had just turned her majority, was boxed up in Baltimore by one who stood to her in relation of a companion, a young man, who had the box conveyed as freight to the depot in Baltimore, consigned to Philadelphia. Nearly all one night it remained at the depot with the living agony in it, and after being turned upside down more than once, the next day about ten o'clock it reached philadelphia her companion coming on in advance of the box arranged with a hackman george custis to attend to having it brought from the depot to a designated house mrs myers four twelve south seventh street where the resurrection was to take place custis without knowing exactly what the box contained but suspecting from the apparent anxiety and instructions of the young man who engaged him to go after it that it was of great importance while the freight car still remained on the street demanded it of the freight agent not willing to wait the usual time for the delivery of freight at first the freight agent declined delivering under such circumstances the hackman insisted by saying that he wished to dispatch it in great haste said it is all right you know me i have been coming here for many years every day and will be responsible for it the freight master told him to take it and go ahead with it no sooner said than done it was placed in a one-horse wagon at the instance of custis and driven to seventh and minster streets the secret had been entrusted to mrs m by the young companion of the woman a feeling of horror came over the aged woman who had been thus suddenly entrusted with such responsibility a few doors from her lived an old friend of the same religious faith with herself well known as a brave woman and a friend of the slave mrs ash the undertaker or shrouder whom everybody knew among the colored people mrs myers felt that it would not be wise to move in the matter of this resurrection without the presence of the undertaker accordingly she called mrs ash in even her own family was excluded from witnessing the scene the two aged women chose to be alone in that fearful moment shuddering at the thought that a corpse might meet their gaze instead of a living creature however they mustered courage and pried off the lid a woman was discovered in the straw but no sign of life was perceptible their fears seemed fulfilled surely she is dead thought the witnesses get up my child spake one of the women with scarcely life enough to move the straw covering she nevertheless did now show signs of life but to a very faint degree she could not speak but being assisted arose she was straightway aided upstairs not yet uttering a word after a short while she said i feel so deadly weak she was then asked if she would not have some water or nourishment which she declined before a great while, however, she was prevailed upon to take a cup of tea. She then went to bed, and there remained all day, speaking but very little during that time. The second day she gained strength and was able to talk much better, but not with ease. The third day she began to come to herself and talk quite freely. She tried to describe her sufferings and fears while in the box, but in vain in the midst of her severest agony her chief fear was that she would be discovered and carried back to slavery 
She had a pair of scissors with her, and in order to procure fresh air, she had made a hole in the box, but it was very slight. How she ever managed to breathe and maintain her existence, being in the condition of becoming a mother, it was hard to comprehend. In this instance, the utmost endurance was put to the test. She was obviously nearer death than Henry Box Brown, or any of the other box or chest cases that ever came under the notice of the committee. In Baltimore, she belonged to a wealthy and fashionable family, and had been a seamstress and lady's servant generally. On one occasion, when sent of an errand for certain articles in order to complete assignments for the grand opening ball at the Academy of Music, she took occasion not to return, but was among the missing. Great search was made, and a large reward offered, but all to no purpose. A free-colored woman who washed for the family was suspected of knowing something of her going, but they, failing to get aught out of her, she was discharged. Soon after the arrival of this traveler at Mrs. Myers, the committee was sent for and learned the facts as above stated. After spending some three or four days in Mrs. Myers' family, she remained in the writer's family about the same length of time and was then forwarded to Canada. Mrs. Myers was originally from Baltimore and had frequently been in the habit of receiving Underground Railroad passengers. She had always found Thomas Shipley, the faithful philanthropist, a present help in time of need. The young man well knew Mrs. Myers would act with prudence in taking his companion to her house. George Custis, the hackman, a colored man, was cool, sensible, and reliable in the discharge of his duty, as were the other parties, therefore everything was well managed. With this interesting case our narratives end, except such facts of a like kind as may be connected with some of the sketches of stockholders. A large number on the record book must be omitted. This is partly owing to the fact that during the first few years of our connection with the Underground Railroad, so little was written out in the way of narratives that it would hardly be of sufficient interest to publish. And partly from the fact that although there are exceptional cases even among those so omitted that would be equally as interesting as many which have been inserted, time and space will not admit of further encroachment. If in any way we have erred in the task of furnishing facts and important information touching the Underground Railroad, it has not been in overstating the sufferings, trials, perils, and marvelous escapes of those described, but on the contrary. In many instances, after hearing the most painful narratives, we had neither time nor inclination to write them out, except in the briefest manner, simply sufficient to identify the parties, which we did, not dreaming that the dark cloud of slavery was so soon to give way to the bright sunlight of freedom. End of section 41 End of the Underground Railroad, part 4 By William Still